Hello students, this presentation is on patent infringement and we will be discussing here on what is patent infringement and what constitutes patent infringement. Uh, we will also be discussing with regard to various forums for patent infringement disputes and we will be talking about provisions relating to infringement of patents under the Patents Act 1970. We start with what constitutes the infringement of a patent. It is not very clearly mentioned in the Patent Act as to which section is relevant to what is infringement of a patent. Now we have mentioned in our previous presentations, the rights of a patentee is under the section 48 of the Patents Act. So infringement of a patent is the unauthorized making, using, offering for sale, selling any patented invention within India, or importing into India of any patented invention during the term of a patent. If you revisit the section 48, which is the rights of patentees under Patents Act, you will notice that a patent is granted under this Act. The right which is conferred upon the patentee is where the subject matter of the patent is a product. The patentee has the exclusive right to prevent third parties who do not have his consent from the act of making, using, offering for sale, selling, or importing for those purposes that product in India. And secondly, where the subject matter of the patent is process, the patentee has the exclusive right to prevent third parties who do not have his consent from the act of using that process or from the act of using, offering, for sale, selling or importing for those purposes a product obtained directly by the process in India. So infringement of this right would constitute or would amount to the infringement of a patent. Section 104 to Section 114 of the Indian Patents Act 1970 governs the provisions which are related to the infringement of patents. Now, at the outset, what should a patentee do in order to exercise due diligence on the rights that he has been given? A patentee must exercise or undertake periodic monitoring of the patented product or process in order to ensure that there are no infringing activities by the competitors. It is advised that the patentee should have a market watch system in order to keep a tab on competitor products and processes and various other ways like employing patent analytics to keep a tab on the patent publications of potential competitors, whether they are not coming up with any kind of inventions which might be dangerously close or substantially similar to the patented inventions that the patentee must have. So it's important to note that there could be no infringement proceedings until the grant of the patent and in order to obtain damages, the patentee need to show that the infringement has occurred after publication of the patent application. The claims would be identical, that the claims which are claimed in the specification of the patent, it should be identical to alleged product or process which is infringed and the infringer has to have actual notice of publication. The guidelines to determine the infringement of a patent has been laid down by the Supreme Court of India. In the landmark case of Vishwanath Prasad Radhishyam, the citation is given below. The link will be provided down below in the slide. The first guideline would be read the description and then the claims separately. Find out what is the prior art. Then what is the improvement over the prior art? The broad features of the improvement needs to be listed. Then the broad features of the defendant's process or apparatus needs to be compared. And finally, if the defendant's process or apparatus is either identical or comes within the scope of the plaintiff's process or apparatus, then there is an infringement which should be considered in this case. Now we are coming to section 104 which governs the jurisdiction of instituting a suit of infringement. A patentee may file a suit for infringement in a forum not inferior to the district court it may file a suit for infringement either in the district court or in the high court depending upon the pecuniary limits where a counterclaim for revocation is filed by the defendant. Say for example, if a counterclaim for revocation is filed by the defendant in the district court, the suit along with the counterclaim shall be transferred to the high court for decision because only the high court will be having the jurisdiction for determining on a counterclaim. It's important to note in accordance to section 19 of CPC, the patentee may institute a suit for infringement where he resides, carries on business or the patentee may also institute a suit for infringement in a court which is jurisdiction over the area where the cause of action or the infringement arose. Now the Indian Limitation Act governs the period of limitation 
for bringing a suit of infringement of a patent that is three years from the date of infringement. Now, section 104A governs the burden of proof. Say, in a patent infringement suit, in case of a patented process for obtaining a product, the court may direct the defendant to prove that the process used by him to arrive at the product is different from the patented process. If, number one, the subject matter of the process is for obtaining a new product, Number two, the patentee is unable to determine the process actually used. The second condition is wherein the patentee has first proved that the product derived by the alleged infringer is identical to the product directly obtained by the patented process. Now, there are powers of court in certain conditions. Section 105 relates to the power of court to make declaration as to non-infringement, wherein an aggrieved person may file a suit for declaration for non-infringement. The conditions would be that the plaintiff has requested to the patentee for written acknowledgements regarding non-infringement and secondly the patentee has refused to give such acknowledgement. Section 106 relates to the power of court to grant relief in cases of groundless threat wherein a patentee threatens any other person with proceedings for infringement. The aggrieved person thereon may file a suit praying for declaration that the threats are unjustifiable. Uh, the person aggrieved may pray for injunction to stop the threats and thirdly the person aggrieved may pray for damages if applicable in that case two case laws which are relevant to section 106 pertaining to groundless threat are provided below the slide the links are provided the student is requested to read the case laws in order to understand section 106 more better the patent act also provides for exceptions to infringement section 107a is bolat like provisions wherein any act of making constructing using selling or importing a patented invention solely for the development and submission of information required under law either in india or in a country regulating the manufacture construction use sale or import of such product will not be considered as patent infringement say for example there is a pharmaceutical product which is brought in the country for r d research and development or to garner up information which is required to be submitted before the drug regulatory authority and not for any kind of commercial use or sale or distribution would not be considered as patent infringement in India. Uh, section 107B would be parallel import as to importation of patented products by any person from a person duly authorized under law to produce and sell or distribute the product would not be considered as patent infringement in India. Section 107 lays down the defenses which could be taken in patent infringement suits. As mentioned earlier, the defendant in a patent infringement suit may file a counterclaim and in such a counterclaim, every ground of revocation of a patent which is available under section 64 is applicable. The grounds under section 64 has been discussed in detail along with case laws in our previous presentations. A student is requested to refer to the presentations and the case laws. The other array of defenses in a patent infringement suit are one or more of the conditions which are specified in section 47. Section 47 also in turn has been discussed in detail in our previous presentations, but still we'll just mention very briefly about section 47 over here. Now, section 47 lays down certain conditions. The grant of a patent under the Patents Act shall be subject to the conditions which are basically the exceptions. Number one will be any machine apparatus or other article, any patented article, which are made by using a process in respect to which the patent is granted. Such invented article may be imported or made by or on behalf of the government for the purpose merely of government's own use. Secondly, any process in respect to which the patent is granted may be used by or on behalf of the government for the purpose merely of its own use. Thirdly, if it is used for any kind of educational purpose, any kind of experimental or research purpose, including the imparting of instructions to pupils or students, and the patented invention, if it is imported by the government for merely its own use or distribution of any government hospitals or any dispensaries which are directed towards public service, etc., so these are some of the exceptions wherein the defendant could take these defenses in the patent infringement suits under section 47 of the act. Section 109 of the Patents Act deals with the rights of exclusive licensee. An exclusive licensee will be having the rights of a patentee to institute a patent infringement suit and to pray for damages, but such kind of rights attributable to an exclusive licensee would accrue in case of the exclusive licensee only after the date of license. 
Section 108 deals with the remedies which are available with regard to the patent infringement. There will be three types of remedies. First of all, injunction. An injunction is basically an order from the court in order to stop a person from carrying out the infringing activity. Injunction is basically of a temporary nature and a permanent nature. We will be discussing the temporary injunction in much more detail in the next slide. The second type of remedy is the account of profits, which is basically an order by the court to garner the amount in terms of profits which have been accumulated by the alleged infringer by way of using and selling the infringing products. And lastly, damages, which are prayed by the plaintiff in the form of pecuniary damages which are awarded by the court when the case of infringement is established. Now, there are certain exceptions also wherein there are restrictions on the power of court to grant damages or account of profits for infringement which are generally governed by the section 111 by, of the Patent Act. Wherein against a defendant who proves of not being aware of the existence of the patent at the date of infringement, in this kind of a situation, the court may not be able to grant damages to the plaintiff or to the patentee who is a plaintiff in this case where infringement committed after failure of renewal fee payment within the prescribed period but not before the extension of the period and lastly there also would be a restriction on the power of the court to grant damages wherein it was found that the specification is amended after publication until the date of decision allowing amendment unless the court is satisfied that the original publication was framed in good faith so it can be seen that there are restrictions on the power of court while granting damages or accounts or profits for infringement. The exceptions that we have discussed in section 111, these shall not affect the power of the court to grant an injunction in his suit for infringement of a patent. So it is clearly established that there would be no restriction on the power of court with regard to injunctions. Now coming to injunctions, we'll be discussing on the temporary injunction and the provisions regarding the same in the next slide. The procedure for seeking temporary injunction has been provided under Order 39 Rule 1 and 2 of CPC 1908. Since this is a civil remedy which is awarded by the courts, an important case law will be Gujarat Bottling Company Limited versus Coca-Cola Company, which is a 1995 judgment. The link is provided here below for the student to study. The object of such a temporary injunction is to protect the plaintiff, the patent in this case, against injury by violation of his right for which he could not be adequately compensated in damages recoverable in the action if the uncertainty were resolved in his favor at the trial, which is simply to say that in relation to the nature of the right, one can say that since it is an intellectual property right and if the alleged infringer is not injuncted immediately, then the damages that the plaintiff is going to incur, it might not be adequately compensated by way of any kind of pecuniary damages, which has been laid down by the case law that we have mentioned right now. There are three factors which need to be satisfied in order to meet the criteria which is set down under Order 39 Rule 1 and 2 of CPC. Firstly, there has to be a prima facie case as to an infringement has indeed occurred. Secondly, the balance of convenience should be considered as to which party is more inconvenienced. It should be in the favor of the plaintiff. And thirdly, the plaintiff has to show that it will suffer irreparable loss if an order for a temporary injunction is not awarded by the court at that point of time. Going by the expression, the injunction granted by the court under the above provisions of temporary injunction is temporary, of course, in nature, and it can operate until disposal of the suit and until further orders. The notable patent litigations in India are given below in the slides. The citations are given over here as well as the links which are given below the slides. The students are requested to go through the judgments and if there are clarifications or any queries or any doubts which are required to be answered by us, feel free to contact us at doubts at fusionlawschool.com. Thank you so much for your time and happy reading. Hi viewers, to know more about us, please visit fusionlawschool.com or you can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter or Google+. Links are provided here. To stay updated, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. If you like this video, please like, share and comment down below.